How are you all doing today? Good, good. So what is this? I'm sure all of you know exactly what that is, and probably many of you are, are carrying them with you right now. So this is a mobile phone. So when I was a kid, mobile phones were like this big. They lasted like 20 minutes. All they could do was they could get your voice from place to place. Even 10 years ago, the height of sophistication as far as mobile communications was concerned was pounding an email into your BlackBerry. But today, you could literally take this device right here, walk down the street. If you're willing to pay Rogers the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the data charges, you could literally take that device, walk down the street, have streaming video straight to you wherever you are while communicating with your friends in real time. So the question is, and if you want to talk about combustion, I mean, these kinds of devices have literally set the world on fire. There are all kinds of revolutions around the world that have been ignited by social media, powered mostly by mobile devices. So if you think about it, Take such a device, open it up. Where is all this progress coming from? Where it's really coming from is a field that I actually do a lot of my research in, and that is called the field of information theory. So what are, I consider myself an information theorist. Information theorists basically look at the mathematical science of communication. We look at how to make communication more efficient, how to make it more reliable, how to analyze different ways in which to communicate. So if you take a step back and think, OK, um, how, has, how has communication transformed the world? For the most part, up till now and over the last few decades, the way in which communication has worked is in terms of information technology. So your computer, your smartphone, uh, through things like Wi-Fi or through things like fiber optics or wires. A lot of it is electromagnetic, electronic, electrical. Is that the only way in which we can communicate? I'm going to suggest the answer is no. So let's talk about that for a minute. What are these? On the left, we have um, uh, an electron micrograph of E. coli. On the right, and I hope you can see this, we have uh, uh, a, a microscope view uh, of a blown up, um, uh, a blown up uh, set of leaf cells from, from, a, from a, uh, a piece of moss. So what's different between these? I mean, the internal machinery between the cells on the right and the cells on the left are much the same. So how is it that those cells on the right knew to organize themselves into a leaf? Let's put this a different way. Let's say I walked off stage. So I am a human being. In my body, there are approximately 10 trillion cells. So let's say I walk off stage right now, and instead they wheeled on a vat containing 10 trillion E. coli. Would you listen to those 10 trillion E. coli give a talk? <laughs> Probably not. So what's the difference between the E. coli and the leaf and myself? The difference is, in the leaf, those cells knew how to organize themselves because they were told. In other words, there's a communication process going on here. Similarly, in my body, uh, constantly in, in, in your body as well, constantly cells are being uh, told to grow, differentiate, even, even they're being told to die in, in, in particularly programmed ways. There's communication happening constantly, and so far, this communication is poorly understood by the same researchers who brought you, who brought you the great improvements in cell phones. And this is literally a communication problem. If you look at this, um, the process by which this works in the body is called signal transduction. On the left, we have a cell. On the right, we have a, a, another cell. So this cell on the left is sending a message to the cell on the right. In the middle, we have these little proteins called ligands. And basically, what they're doing is they're floating across the gap using Brownian motion. So what could information theory potentially say about this? Well, if you just ignore the labels there, think of that thing on the left as an antenna. Think of the thing on the right as another antenna. And think of those, uh, those entities that are, that are navigating across the gap as radio waves. So now, now the connection is starting to become clear. In fact, information theory is flexible enough that we can use the same tools to describe this system as the, the, the radio communication problem that I talked about in the beginning. So in other words, the question that I'm really motivated by here, uh, one of them anyway, is what can information theory tell us about biology? Signal transduction is key to multicellular organisms. Disorders of signal transduction cause disease. So can we use the same techniques that go into your cell phone to tell us something about disease? It goes a little further. So how many people know who that is? Richard Feynman. 
He's a Nobel laureate physicist. Uh, he died about, uh, about 20 years ago. But in 1959 at Caltech, he gave an important talk called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And that's a transcript of there at, at lower right. This talk is credited with basically blowing open the field of nanotechnology. And in the intervening 55 years, uh, nanotechnology has become a staple of, of science fiction, of, of speculative fiction, and so on. We're accustomed to seeing in, in fiction things like uh, machines that repair themselves with nanotechnology, or tiny little robots swimming through your body performing surgery, or attacking tumors, or something like that. So here's, here's something that, that you might find surprising. Those, those tiny little robots actually exist. There are people who make them. Um, if you want, uh, I could put you in touch with a professor who, whose entire research is dedicated to making those tiny little robots that can actually go into your bloodstream, and he does experiments on them. It's mind-blowing. So why aren't we living in the future? Where are these applications? Well, in fact, let's come back to the problem of the organism. One, uh, a collection, a, a, a large collection of nanorobots is not very useful if they can't talk to each other. This is the field that we could potentially blow open by learning about how microorganisms communicate. It's called nano-networking. So can we use the techniques that, uh, that cells use to communicate with each other? Because really, if you think about it, cells and bacteria and so on, these are just nano-devices in some sense. They're very small devices that fit in the body. They're, they're well-conditioned uh, to existing and, 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 and thriving and communicating already inside the human body. So can we learn that same technique in order to blow open these amazing potential technologies that right now only exist in science fiction. It's closer than you think, because like I said, those devices already exist. So, now you might be thinking, how exactly do we do this? So you might imagine that in my lab, I've got all kinds of crazy apparatus worth millions and millions of dollars, that uh, I'm constantly doing these mad science experiments, well, maybe a little bit, but really, that's not the case. All you need in order to get started in this field, as we showed in my lab, is a spray bottle on the left, a little bit of alcohol inside. It could be rubbing alcohol. It could be ethanol. Famously, it could be vodka, if you saw any of the media covers that we got. And on the right, how do you detect alcohol vapor? A breathalyzer. This is commodity hardware. You can get it off the shelf. It's very cheap. And uh, down in the lower right, you have a depiction of uh, exactly how we designed our... Uh, uh, our receiver, and what we did was we showed that you can actually communicate this way. We're, we're the first people in the world to send a text message using strictly molecular communication. What do I mean by molecular communication? This is exactly what, uh, what the cells in your body do. They, they're, they're sending ligands to each other. Now, we don't have to use alcohol. We can use anything we want. It just so happened that alcohol was cheap. We don't have to uh, we, don't have to, uh, we don't have to have everything very big. We don't have to send vapor. Uh, our goal is ultimately to take these, this system and shrink it down to the point where we can actually start to solve these, uh, these nanoscale communication problems. So the, what I want to leave you with is this. I'm an information theorist. Information theorist has already changed the world, has already set the world on fire. What can information theory say about biology? Can it help us understand disease? Can it help us understand development? Moreover, what can information theory do to unlock these fantastic new potential applications in, um, in nanotechnology? This is what I'm passionate about, and this is exactly what I'm working on. Thank you very much.